So we've been talking about the elements that went into the muscle's ability to generate contractile force. We talked about the beginning sarcomere length, that optimal sarcomere length, which would generate the most force. The frequency of stimulation, that is rapid impulses before the sarcomeres fully relax. We talked about the large number of muscle fibers activated which brought us into the concept of motor units, the size of the motor units, or how many motor units were activated at any one time. And next time we'll talk about the muscle fiber types, which will also affect the contractile force, which ones are stimulated. Uh, but this time we're going to talk about not so much how to generate a lot of force, but how to modulate that force, because we don't always want to generate a lot of force. So this brings us into another related concept right over here. And this is your muscle tone, how you get resting tension in skeletal muscle, right? Because as you're sitting there right now, you know, you're sitting there watching, you think, well, I'm not really moving my muscles. You are have a certain muscle tone. You're not completely limp like you would be if you were sleeping or in a coma or something like that. So in an awake person, right, your postural muscles in particular are always keeping some kind of low level tone, right? And also remember we talked about say the stability of certain joints like your shoulder joint. One of the main factors that was influencing the stability of something, you know, that very unstable shoulder joint was the uh, muscle tone around it, right? Keeping it kind of secure, keeping that uh, humoral head secure in the glenoid cavity right there. So resting tension, this muscle tone, as well as all over your body, whenever you need to keep some kind of postural, right? So how you're gonna do this is this rotating basis. So you got these three motor units, right? Purple, blue, and red, innovating a certain amount of muscle fibers, right? Number one goes, and then somewhere before this one fully contracts, this one will go. And then somewhere before that one contracts, this one will go, right? So they're gonna go, if this was only three of them, you'd go one, two, three, one, two, three, or whatever the sequence was, right? So again, this will be so that the purple one, you know, you could do the same thing by just keep on stimulating the purple one. You'd have the same level of contraction, but the purple one would get all tired. So you want to kind of share that, uh, you want to share that uh, stimulation. So this, right, some motor units on a random and revolving basis right over there, right? And the stimulation is low enough. You're not really moving anything. You're just creating muscle tone, right? Postural muscles, like your fact that your neck is hopefully maintaining an upright position as you watch this. Right here is just due to this resting tension, right? The fact that you're not flopping over in your seat right now right, is due to the resting tension. The other thing about this whole thing is that you're not thinking about it. You don't have to constantly think to yourself, oh, I gotta keep my neck up, or maybe you do, I don't know. But in general, right, your postural muscles are gonna be automatic. You're not gonna have to think about them, and you're not gonna have to think about making the slight adjustments that you need as your whole body moves in different positions. This is gonna be a sort of subconscious function or a reflexive function, right? not being controlled like the rest of your thing. When I ask you to flex your elbow, right, that's your brain sending down signals and you're doing it, but you're not thinking about keeping your you know, sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius muscle at some level of tension. All right, so this is under involuntary and reflexive control. And I'll say that this uh, section that I'm going to talk about, the receptors involved in that is not in your book, but I'll get into those in a second. But in any case, when you think about muscle tone, right, you're thinking, you know, lack of muscle tone is what you call the, a flaccid, like right? your muscles are completely flaccid, state of limpness. So a small, mention, a small amount of tautness is due to those weak involuntary contractions in that constantly shifting pattern. And this is all a neural thing, right? This is happening because your motor units, your motor neurons are being told to, in some way, by something, to maintain this, that rotating basis of contraction right here. Okay, so if there's any kind of problem, 
like in this case, or you were just basically maybe asleep or on you know heavy sedation. Uh, you get this, if that motor neuron function, if you stop firing those action potentials, or your muscles basically just become limp. Okay. Then, you know, while we're here on muscle tone, at some point in bio 145, you'll talk about the smooth muscle tissues, right? That line your gut to and your uh, blood vessels and stuff like that. So, you know, this is also that tone of those is also going to be important. It's going to be the same sort of constant sort of level of what you call tonicity, a certain level of tautness or relaxation in it. Right, so that's hypotonia, decrease or loss of muscle tone. And there's also hypertonia, and this is going to be increased muscle tone. And you could think of that in two ways, or they talk about this in two ways, spasticity, this increased muscle tone in and this is about tendon reflexes and these pathological reflexes. And we're not, we don't have to get into the detail there, but this is, that's one sort of function of increased sort of contraction without you wanting to do so, right? The other one is rigidity, right? Increased muscle tone, uh, not about reflexes, but in this case, it's another kind of neural problem. In this case, uh, you know, we're talking about tetanus, you get your tetanus shot, not your vaccine, which prevents that kind of thing. I mean, uh, it's, this is a problem in the central nervous system, but the result in the central nervous system is that motor neuron keeps on sending in action potentials, right? This is a picture from the 1500s, and he was generally described to be possessed by the devil, right? But this was actually, uh, he actually had tetanus, right? He had a bacterial infection. Uh, this is from the uh, Lancet Journal. Uh, in this case, pay attention, like all the muscles contracting, all the facial muscles right, that are just contracting in a single contraction because of this tetanus right here, causing these distortions of the face right there. So this is continued contraction, right? And like excess, excess sort of muscle tone or rigidity. And then this is a red dot here. You don't have to know this, but I mentioned botulism. Over here, Botox, and the because uh, this might come up in the nervous system, but your the Botox, what it was doing was preventing that uh, fusion of the synaptic vesicles, right? So that there was no release of neurotransmitter, and there was paralysis, right? Which you don't generally want, although they've tamed it and allowed you to kind of uh, freeze your face so you look longer, younger. But uh, in this case, this is from this botulism toxin. Right, and you get paralysis, no movement basically. Uh, there's a similar mechanism going on here, except it's a whole different set of neurotransmitters within the central nervous system. These ones that would normally inhibit uh, these motor neurons are being, this, there's a sort of dysfunction over here and these motor neurons are overactive, right? And they keep on sending those action potentials. And so even though it's a similar mechanism, it's, it's operating on, very different uh, cells, right? Which is gonna have a very different effect. Gonna have that rigidity. I, I won't you ask right. about it. So let's go back to how we actually control it. I told you that you're not consciously maintaining your muscle tone. You don't have to, your brain's got other things to worry about. So that all that muscle tone uh, is going to be under involuntary reflexive control. And again, this chapter in your book, uh, doesn't go into this at all. It mentions it very lightly. This is actually, it goes within the nervous system. Um, but, you know, going way back to earlier lectures when we talked about receptors and stimuli picking up, uh, receptors picking up stimuli, right? and then sending them through afferent fibers. And then they were going to go to control center. And then they were going to go to an efferent one, right? We'll see this when we get to the nervous system, these reflexes over here where a stimulus picks up some kind of information from a receptor. I mean, receptor picks some kind of stimulus, sends it in, and then cause goes to the control center, sends it out to efferent fibers and to the effector. Right, so the muscle tone is gonna to be maintained by what are called proprioceptors, right? These receptors, which are important in maintaining your sense of balance, right? Without you thinking about it. Right, they're monitoring what's going on in your muscle. So I'm gonna take a look at 
these two types of proprioceptors, your muscle spindle fibers and your Golgi tendon organs to kind of get a sense of how your muscle tone is maintained. Within your muscle, one of these proprioceptors are called your neuromuscular spindle fibers. And they're basically these modified muscle cells immersed within your muscle uh, and they're in there. And you have these sensory fibers from neurons, right? these afferent fibers that are wrapped around this. And when this muscle is stretched, right, when it goes from a contracted to a stretched space, that causes these uh, receptor, right, to signal to this one, get put a whole bunch of action potentials. That's what these little fast lines mean to go tell the nervous system that the muscle is being stretched, right? And in a relaxed state, those, those signals kind of slow down. Your nervous system can recognize this as the muscles in a relaxed state. Or if the muscle is even fully contracted, right, it can recognize that as well because it's getting this kind of signal. When it gets that kind of signal for that, it's going to pass the, the, the signal through the afferent pathway to the control center. And it, when it's stretched like that, your nervous system wants to kind of back off. It wants to balance that a little bit. So it talks to another efferent motor uh, fiber that's going to send its axons out. And the response is to actually contract the muscle. It's going to tell the motor neuron to go on and contract that a little bit so your muscle isn't over stretched. Right? This is one of those kind of homeostatic mechanisms to make sure you're muscles within homeostatic range and also keep it at a certain level of tension all right so the muscle spindle fibers inside the muscle over here i was about to write very heavy orange right here and i forgot but right, you have this bag of food here and the grocery guy puts a bunch of more stuff in it right that causes an immediate stretching of your muscle over here right? and instead of dropping it completely um, this, your muscle spindle fibers cause a little bit of contraction so you can maintain that position instead of dropping it down. All right, so that's one kind of function of your muscle spindle fiber besides normal posture, right? This is just a more dynamic sort of function of how these neuromuscular spindle fibers might work without you thinking about it at all, right? The other type of proprioceptor is so-called your Golgi tendon organs. They are located within the tendon. Right, remember your muscle comes to those connective tissue layers all form the dense regular connective tissue that inserts onto your muscle right the contractile force was over here but it was being transmitted through the tendon onto the bone the golgi tendon organ is inserted within the collagen fibers of that tendon right here okay so when you contract right you're pulling on your bones there's tension generated right, from the muscle to the bone right here, and these Golgi tendon organs right there are going to somehow sense that tension, and you're going to have that same sort of reflexive pathway that's going to cause this some kind of inhibitory reaction that's going to tell you to relax that muscle in some way, right? Don't worry about the details of how it does that, but the response is going to be to relax that muscle. Right, so you had one in the muscle, the, the spindle fibers were in the muscle detecting stretch. This is going to be detecting strain or tension. And they're going to both do the opposite of what the action was to kind of maintain uh, homeostatic conditions. So let's look at another you know, example you're probably familiar with right here, right? That patellar reflex doctor hits you with a you know, rubber hammer right on your patella ligament over here below the kneecap, right, from your patella ligament onto your tibial tuberosity. Right there, it hits it. That tendon is attached to the muscle. When you hit that little tendon right there, there's a little bit of a stretch in it, which is actually going to stretch the muscle a little bit, right? So you wouldn't think that that little stretch would do something, but obviously the spindle fibers detect that, right? And we're going to find out the organization of this. Don't worry about it, but it goes into the nervous system. And then the response is going to be to relax, actually, the hamstring muscles and to contract your quads, right? Giving that kicking motion ahead.
Is that your knee jerk, knee jerk reflex? That's just a, an example. And then in general, a little more sort of practical one because during the course of evolution, probably you weren't getting hit on the knee with a little rubber hammer. But you know, this is kind of an example, uh, what we saw before, right? Your Golgi tension reflex. If there was a heavy load and this were to cause too much of a contraction here that might hurt the muscle, right? This inhibiting interneuron goes over there and then releases it, relaxes it, right? Which may make you drop the load, but it might protect your muscle as much as you might think that's not a big load. You just have to imagine it something heavier. So this is, you know, one of those more active functions, but again, it's a little hard, it's a little easier to describe than what's going on constantly as your body makes these constant little adjustments in your posture, right? As you move along or, you know, shift your position or something like that. All right, so those are those proprioceptors. All right, the last thing I wanna say about this is another sort of, uh, this is an interest of mine because I have like these really bad muscle cramps. And I'm always like Googling, what's going on? Why do I have muscle cramps? And if you Google, why do I get muscle cramps? You're gonna get things like you're dehydrated. You need more potassium. You need more calcium. And I'm like, well, why does it only happen in my calf, right? Or my adductor muscles? Like, why am I getting in specific places? I'm dehydrated all over my body. What's going on, right? So I kept on looking it up and I found some obscure, a little more obscure stuff about it. And here's what I learned here. Okay, uh, those, and what it involves ultimately are these spindle and Golgi tendon organs that are kind of monitoring constantly your stretch and reflex and adjust, right? So that you're not too contracted or not too stretched. It actually has to do with a whole bunch of stuff, spinal reflexes, all that stuff, but we're just gonna be focused on this peripheral receptor input, those proprioceptors. Right? Remember they're fundamental to the control, right? Maintenance and posture. If there's some sort of problem, and it may be like dehydration, and it may certain muscles are affected, but what you're going to get is uh, re resulting in increased motor neuron activity. That is the ones that these muscle spenders firing, right? you're going to increase excitation, right? Telling your muscle thinks it's being stretched for some reason. And so it's going to, what's this going to happen when it thinks it's being stretched? It's going to contract. Right? It's going to like squeeze in on you. They're firing off and they're causing that reflex action right there. Okay, so that's just a, a sort of thing that I, that I found out here, and that has to do with these two proprioceptors over here. Why you might get these muscle contractions? It does have to do with fatigue and everything, but the fact that it's happening in certain muscles and stuff like that, there's some kind of reflexive action going on with those. So you could ask me about this if you're interested. I, I'm not going to get too much into that, but it's an interesting uh, concept. All right, but that is how your body unconsciously monitors and responds to different levels of stretch in your muscle so that you maintain the proper level of muscle tone. All right, we will see you next time. Goodbye.